Okay, sorry guys, it just cut out there for a second. I kind of switched apps, but I figured it out now. Um, so as I was saying, um, there is a better example of this or a more intuitive example that I found right here. So here, this basically illustrates this using two different mediums. So here we have steel and then we have water. So where the impedance of water is less than the impedance of steel. So this is our this is synonymous with our first examples. This is synonymous with number one, whereas this one's synonymous with number two. So here we have our pressure wave that's moving through the medium water. When it hits this boundary, and this is because again the impedance of water is less than the impedance of steel, this reflects back this way in a constructive way. And that actually amplifies the pressure wave on the in the second medium, which is steel. So here, the second example is when our first medium is actually a higher impedance than our second medium. So here, impedance is less for water than it is for steel. Here, steel is a higher impedance than that of water. So if we, if we send our pressure wave through steel as a medium, it hits this boundary and it reflects back in a destructive manner. And you can tell because these are out of phase. So then our, um, well, the effect that this has when it hits this boundary, if the impedance of medium one is greater than the impedance of medium two is that this affects this pressure wave negatively. So this scenario will amplify it and this scenario will act in a deconstructive way. Intensity reflection and transmission coefficients, vertical incidence. So a similar concept to pressure reflection and transmission is intensity reflection and transmission. It uses the same analogous concepts as when we were discussing impedance in terms of its analogy to electric circuits. So here our intensity is analogous to power our pressure is analogous to voltage, and our particle speed is analogous to current, um, which is how we end up getting this equation here, um, where the difference between the intensity and, I guess, conservation of energy with intensity and conservation of energy with pressure is that we end up with this equation for the conservation of energy when it comes to intensity. So this is a little bit more intuitive. So simply the amount that's reflected plus the amount that's transmitted in terms of intensity equals one. So our intensity reflection coefficient is going to be the ratio between the intensity that's reflected versus the intensity that's incident. Um, and then if we fill in these values based on this equation here, we end up with this final equation here, which is actually analogous to our pressure uh, re pressure reflection coefficient squared. So then if we look at our intensity transmission of coefficient, we have it right here, it's Ti. So same thing, it's the ratio of intensity that's transmitted versus intensity that's incident. And then if we fill in these values based on our equation here, then we end up with um, this equation here, and then we can reduce that to this equation here. So it's one minus R squared. So pressure reflection coefficient at tissue interface. So there is a little reflection if the materials are acoustically similar and a lot of reflection when there is a mismatch of acoustic impedances. 
So for an example, at an interface between soft tissue and bone, a very large reflected signal or echo results. So this is, for example, soft tissue and bone. Um, so a very large reflected sig signal or echo results, and this comprises about 40% of the incident energy. So this greatly attenuates the transmitted beam and makes the imaging of structures deeper lying than bone to be extremely difficult. For a soft tissue gas interface, so that's what's happening here, about 99% of the beam intensity is reflected, making it impossible to scan distal structures deeper than the lungs or gas-containing bowel. Versus what we have here, so the transmission rate is high for a soft to soft. So here we have muscle and blood, muscle and kidney, soft tissue water. Um, so those waves are transmitted quite easily between a soft to soft material. Scattering. So scattering is the process by which secondary spherical waves are generated as the wave propagates. Many targets within the body are much smaller than the acoustic wavelength. For these targets, the geometric optics equations for reflection and refraction do not hold. So instead, we assume that when these targets are excited by an incident acoustic plane wave, they vibrate as small spherical bodies, giving rise to spherical waves whose amplitude is some fraction of the incident wave amplitude. Reflection can be categorized as either specular or diffused. Specular reflectors are large smooth surfaces such as bone, whereas the sound wave is reflected back, uh, where the sound wave is reflected back in a singular direction. So that's what we have been talking about thus far. So the greater the acoustic impedance between the two tissue surfaces, the greater the reflection and the brighter the echo will appear on ultrasound. Conversely, Soft tissue is classified as a diffuse reflector, where adjoining cells create an uneven surface, causing the reflections to return in various directions in relation to the transmitted beam. However, because of the numerous surfaces, sound is able to get back to the transducer in a relatively uniform manner. So here we have um, scattering, where the reflector size is comparable to or smaller than the wavelength. So here we have diffused reflection, where the reflector surface has a roughness comparable to or smaller than the wavelength of the incident. This is of the incident wave. So here we have an example how speckled echoes um, arise, where here we have our different particles, where the echoes are separated, um, you can see it's a low density, where here we have a high density of particles and the echoes actually interfere. So this is how we get our speckle noise. So this is an example of an image and how these different, um, I guess, physical phenomena will affect the actual image itself. So that's specular reflection, diffuse reflection, and scattering. So here we have our ultrasonic probe. It's shooting ultrasound waves into the body and detecting um, their echoes. So here we have an example of diffused reflection right here. So you can see that there's actually a weak definition of the boundary there, where the boundary is going to be of the diaphragm. So that's the large, relatively smooth surface. So because we have our uneven surface here, we end up with some of these ultrasounds scattering back in different directions, and we get an unclear visual of where this actual boundary is. Here, because the uh, ultrasounds are generally at a perpendicular angle, the specular, specular reflection is going to be strong. So this boundary down here is defined in a pretty strong manner.
Um, all throughout this image in here, you can see scattering or speckle noise, um, and that is as the ultrasound is hitting different particles in the body, and it's just scattering upon arrival. So we did mention this briefly before, um, we have different types of ultrasonic probes. So we have our, in this example, we have linear, we have convex, and then we have 2D probes. Um, and generally they're used to serve different purposes or to capture different things within the body. So mostly we'll be talking about the linear probe. So, single element probes are the simplest transducer assembly. For imaging, the ultrasound beam must be steered within the body. Modern systems use either mechanical or, elect or electronic methods to scan the beam, which allows for real-time imaging. Transducer assemblies having multiple elements can be electronically scanned in order to sweep the field of view. The basic arrangement of the elements in these assemblies is linear. Each element is rectangular and focused on the longer dimension using a lens. Each element can be pulsed independently. By varying the timing, for instance, by making the pulse from each transdu transducer progressively delayed going up the line, a pattern of constructive interference is set up that results in radiating a quasi-plane ultrason ultrasonic beam at a set angle, depending on the progressive time delay. In other words, by changing the progressive time delay, the beam can be steered electronically. It can be swept almost like a searchlight through the tissue or object being examined, and the data from multiple beams are put together to make a visual image showing a slice through the object. So here you can see our transducer from one direction, and then if we twist it on its side, you can see it from the other direction. Each of these elements are different transducers. So in this particular one, there's 128 different elements, and each of those is set up as a single one, which is sort of what we looked at before. So we have our backing layer and our matching layer in front, and then we have electrodes on either end. Um, and that's, again, because these are piezoelectric crystals. Um, here we have a cylindrical lens right there and that can help to steer the beams. So as mentioned you can do this mechanically or you can do this electronically. So this is more of a mechanical method whereas this is referring more to an electronic method uh, which we'll get into. So ultrasonic steering and focusing is based on something called um, Huygens' principle. So he was a Dutch scientist and he developed a useful uh, technique for determining in detail how and where waves propagate. Starting from some known position, Huygens' principle states that every point on a wavefront is a source of wavelets that spreads out in the forward direction at the same speed as the wave itself, where the new wavefront is a line tangent to all of the wavelets. Huygens' principle is an accurate technique for determining how and where waves propagate. The principle explains the laws of reflection, refraction, and helps us understand diffraction, where again, diffraction is the bending of a wave around the edges of an opening or another obstacle. So here you can see an example of, we have sound sources. Each of these sound sources is a source of um, wavelets that spread out in the forward direction. And each of those creates a different 
wave front. So this is the wave front. So if we send out sound from every single one of these sources, we end up with a sort of cohesive wave with one wave front. So these waves can either be in phase, which means they're constructive, or out of phase, which means that they're destructive. And we sort of saw the result, or I guess, what the effects of that are um, in the example that I used with steel and water. Phased arrays use electronic steering and focusing to achieve a B scan without transducer movement, where B scan is just a type or it's a mode of ultrasound imaging. So this is done using the linear array of transducer elements from slide 28. So that's what we had just looked at two slides ago. So this is a linear array of transducer elements. A directed beam is achieved by timing the firing of each element so that the sound each produces adds coherently in the desired direction and incoherently otherwise. On receiving the signals, the array is made direction sensitive by delaying the received signals and summing them coherently. So here we have a transmission of pulses. Um, and you can see that they're not all sent at the same time, right? Some of them have a specific delay. And because of Huygens' principle and the way that waves work, what ends up happening is these waves, because of the different time delay, come out and they converge at a specific point where you get a large pulse. So when these are reflected back, you end up summing these signals to get this large pulse. So this has to do with geometric approximations that hold very near to the face of the transducer. So that's, we're talking about this here. So this, basically um, is talking about, so this is talking about resolution, um, but again, the behavior of the waves closer to the transducer head is different from the behavior of the waves much farther away from the transducer head. So at the transducer, beam width is approximately equal to the width of the transducer. And actually I'm going to pull up these other slides as an example. Okay. So this is our transducer. So at the transducer, again, the beam width is approximately equal to the width of the transducer. So that's D. Then the beam converges to its narrowest width, which is half of the width of the transducer at a perpendicular distance from the transducer called the near zone length. So this is our near zone length, and this is how this beam converges at a width of d over 2. At a distance greater than the near zone length, so that's the far zone, the beam diverges such that it becomes the width of the transducer again when the distance from the transducer to the reflector is twice the near zone length. So it has this pattern of convergence into its smallest point here at d divided by two, and then it has the opposite pattern of divergence after that. Piezoelectric elements in a transducer operate at different times and can narrow the pulse beam with improved lateral resolution. This process of focusing leads to the creation of a focal region within the near zone, but not the far zone. So that's this example here. So this is the process of focusing. <clears throat> 
So again, here we have our narrow bean width, and then we have our our D. So that's um, the dis the width of the transducer, and we have our focal length here, narrow beam width, and our focal region is here. So focusing shortens the distance of the narrowest point of the beam from the transducer. So that is to say it reduces the near zone length to a shorter value called the focal length. So that's our focal length. The beam beyond the focal region is divergent, and so there is a reduction in lateral resolution of structures deeper than this point. So that makes sense. From this point on, our beam is diverging again. So this is going to be our best point for focusing. So that is what we're referring to here, where this is going to be our focal region, and this is going to be our resolution. So these equations here are for those different distances, because they're measured in distances, um, and this is for focusing again. And this is based on a negative six decibel beam width, which, or negative six decibels for each transducer. Um, and that is just a typical value that's used in ultrasound. So these equations basically say, this is how you can get the beam width, or this is how you can get the resolution uh, for six decibel uh, beam width. And this is how you can get the focal region for a success, negative successful focusing depth. So beam forming and steering. So again, we're still talking about a linear array of transducer elements. So Based on the timing of each electronic pulse at each element, different beam effects can be achieved. So you can fire them all at the same time and you end up with a synchronous beam. You can fire them all at a time delay, a linear type time delay, to get beam steering. So you can steer your wave in a specific direction. You can um, fire them in a way that you end up with a focus beam. So that's what we were just talking about with our resolution and, and focal region. And you can do both. So you can fire them in a manner that both steers and focuses the beam. And all of this is done simply by controlling the time at which each transducer fires. So this comes back to our spatial resolution. So there's spatial resolution and this is in the lateral direction. So here again, right here, we have our converging and diverging beam again, where lateral resolution with respect to an image containing pulses of ultrasound scanned across a plane of tissue is the minimum distance that, be, that can be distinguished between two reflectors located in perpendicular um, orientation to the direction of the ultrasound beam. So lateral resolution is high when the width of the beam of ultrasound is narrow, which makes sort of intuitive sense, right? So our resolution is going to be high when this beam, when this focal region is going to be narrow. So again, if we're talking about resolution, we're talking about the distance between two points. So I guess the, the minimum distance that's required between two different points to be able to view them as being separate. So then if we're talking about the lateral direction, if, we're, if the beams are coming this way, we're talking about being able to separate an object that is 
like two different objects like that. So that's going to be in the lateral direction. So we're saying, what's the minimum distance between these two points that's required to be able to see them as separate points? So here, that's the size of the focal point, which is our lateral resolution, which is the same as our slice thickness. So that's only in one direction. And then this is going to be the equation for that based on our negative 6 decibel beam width. And again, we're using the, the concepts of the full width at half maximum to be able to calculate this exact distance. So those concepts are go into the equation for dr here. Axial resolution is the minimum distance that can be differentiated between two reflectors located in parallel to the direction of the ultrasound beam. So if we're talking about parallel, parallel this time, there's an example right here where if we have our, I'll draw it up here, if we have our ultrasound beam, instead of like this, we're actually looking at the minimum distance required to be able to see these two points apart, right? That looks like a happy face, but you're looking for the minimum distance between those two different points, and that has that intuitively is related to the pulse time, right? So mathematically, axial resol resolution is equal to half the spatial pulse length. Axial resolution is high when the spatial pulse length is short. So spatial pulse length is the product of the number of cycles in a pulse of ultrasound and the wavelength, right? where most pulses consist of two or three cycles. So I'll pull up another, pull up an image here. Okay, so we're looking at here, our transducer. Um, we have our damping material, thick element. And so again, the spatial pulse length is the product of the number of cycles in a pulse of ultrasound um, and the wavelength. So that's here. Um, most pulses consist of two or three cycles, the number of which is determined by damping of piezoelectric elements after excitation, where a high amount of damping reduces the number of cycles in a pulse and hence shortens spatial pulse length. So typically, again, that is ideal because your axial resolution is high when the spatial pulse length is short. So this is an example of where the spatial pulse length is short because of a good deal of damping. If you notice the difference between the, these two images, it's that this has a thin element and more damping material. Whereas if we go back up, this has a thick element and a smaller amount of damping material. So this is the more ideal situation for a high level of axial resolution. However, excessive damping is associated with loss of amplitude and hence low intensity ultrasound. So you don't want too much. So the wavelength of a pulse is determined by the operating frequency of the transducer where transducers of high frequency have a thin piezoelectric element that generates pulses of short wavelength. So that's, again, what we're looking at in this figure. High frequency pulses are attenuated well in soft tissue, which means that they may not be reflected back sufficiently from deep structures for detection by the transducer. So high frequency pulses um, and a short pulse length are both ideal factors, but of course you don't want them to be too extreme or they're going to take away from your image. 
So here we have our pulse width. So that's T, P, W, so that's here. And if we're looking at our pulse width uh, graphically, we're looking at the full width at half maximum of the envelope of this entire, wow, that was a bad drawing, of this entire um, pulse cycle. So our equation for TPW is going to be this equation here, um, where our axial depth resolution is going to be the change in distance. So we rearrange this formula to get this formula here. And that's going to be our the value of our ax axial resolution. And again, what we're looking for, so this is what I was drawing up in the corner here, is this distance here. Um, and if we're looking at that in terms of our amplitude versus time, it's going to be this time here. So there are different types of ultrasound imaging known as different modes. So the starting point for ultrasound imaging systems is the envelope detected signal called the A mode signal or amplitude mode signal. By firing the transducer on a repetitive basis, a succession of these signals can be displayed on an oscilloscope. This display is called the A mode scan. So that's the A mode. B mode image comprises of a series of bright dots. It uses the intensity of the reflected e echoes to determine the brightness of the dots. Um, M mode scan is obtained by using each A mode, A mode signal as a column in an image. The value of the A mode signal becomes the brightness of the M mode image. So these are going to be the most frequently used. That's really the only ones we're really talking about. Um, so the Doppler imaging is used to determine generally blood velocity, and it interlaces this information with B-mode scanning. The Doppler effect is illustrated in the increased frequency of a moving sound source like a train whistle as it approaches, and the reduced frequency as it passes by, where the relative change in frequency depends on the velocity of the sound emitter relative to the speed of sound in air. So in the Doppler mode imaging, this principle is applied, applied to moving red blood cells. Okay, so envelope detection for an image. So I did just mention envelope detection, which is the basis for A mode, um, A mode imaging. So an envelope detector is an electronic circuit that takes a relatively high frequency amplitude modulated signal as input and provides an output, which is the envelope of the original signal. So here, if we're simply looking at an AD converter, and we have some typical specs for this AD converter, we have our analog signal that's coming into our AD converter. We have our digitized signal as an output, where this is our echo pulse. Um, if we take the absolute value of this, we end up with a rectified signal. And then if we take the low pass filter of this, we end up with this envelope signal. So that is going to dictate our display in our A mode ultrasound. So this is an example of A mode ultrasound in, in practice. So it's going to again be the amplitude of the envelope. So here, if we have our transducer right here, where this is considered to be water in this case, or I guess gel, but it says water for some reason. And then we have our skin surface and then we have our organ here, 
we can see that reflected in our envelope up here. So we can see our transmitted pulse, and then we can see the echo from the skin surface here, and then we have a bunch of soft tissue reflections, and then we have an echo from, an, from the front face of the organ, and then we have the echo from the back face of the organ, and that is going to be essentially our A mode. And again, not again, I never saw this, never said this in the first place, but <laughs> that is going to give us, that is a one directional signal. So that, right, so this just gives us time versus voltage. So it's simply one line through this whole um, human body. So it only gives us one line of this image. So this is an example of our B mode. Uh, so again, our B mode image is comprised of a series of bright dots where the B mode uses the intensity of the reflected echoes to determine brightness of the dots. So B mode here is used to determine polyps in a gallbladder or a breast cyst, which is fluid filled, or a breast lobular carcinoma, so cancer as well. So this is a very common, it's actually the most common use is B mode. So our M mode typically detects motion. So here it's evaluating rapidly moving structures such as cardiac valves and cham uh, cardiac valves and ch uh, chamber walls where the ultrasonic beam is fixed. So we're not actually scanning this. We're just simply fixing it in place. So here you can essentially see the motion over time where A is going to be the ventricular wall, B is going to be the interventricular septum, and therefore the corresponding heartbeat because it's, it's moving with blood pulses, and then you see your far ventricular wall here. Um, and all of this is over time, of course. So we have our 3D image of a phantom here. So this is a, a phantom, so this is not actually a real fetus. It's a, a fake one. Um, and this is an image reconstruction from a series of B-mode images. So that's what a 3D image is. And here you can see the 3D image of this phantom. And you can see very clearly that that's a good representation of what's actually of what that phantom actually is. So here we have a 3D image of an actual fetus and again you can see extremely good results. So this is the Doppler mode that I just talked about briefly. Um, so again, this example here is referring to the example that I gave where it's illustrated in the increased frequency of a moving sound source, like a train whistle or here, um, like an ambulance uh, siren as it approaches and then the reduced frequency as it passes by. So here we have our ultrasound probe, probe, which is our transmitter and our receiver of signals, where our frequency S here is our transmitted frequency. Our frequency T is going to be our received frequency. C is going to stand for the speed of ultrasound, and V is going to be the speed of blood. So here we have V, we have it at a certain, or we have the ultrasound at a certain direction as compared to V. Um, our Doppler frequency in this case is going to be FD, 
which is going to be the difference between FT and FS. So again, we're talking about relative terms. So it's going to be the difference between the received frequency and the transmitted frequency, um, which is going to give us this equation here. And here we can calculate FT using this equation here. So it's in relation to FS. So we're using basically the angle at which the ultrasound is applied um, to get, uh, and also the speed of the ultrasound in order to get our, um, our velocity. So, or sorry, not in order to get our velocity, but in order to get our received frequency. So if we pop back up to this equation, so our Doppler frequency, again, it's the difference between the transmitted and received frequencies. We end up with this equation based on this equation here. And because the speed of ultrasound is going to be much greater than the, the speed of the blood, we know this, we essentially can get rid of this term here. So the difference this term is going to make to this term is so minimal that we just get rid of it. So then we end up with this equation and if we rearrange we can solve for V so we can solve for the blood speed um, based on all of these other measurements that should be known. So this is an example of B mode, a B mode image with color Doppler. So here we're basically getting the velocity of the blood as it's moving through a heart chamber um, where we have the heart rate and we have the different colors, which I imagine are colored based on the different velocities they're moving through. Okay, that is the end of ultrasound.